This is a podcast from the Business Times. Welcome to Wealth with BT hosted by Genevieve Kwa. In this episode, find out how philanthropy can be a powerful tool in the efforts to address and roll back climate change. This episode is brought to you by Picte Wealth Management. Hi there, everyone. I'm Genevieve Kwa, Wealth Editor of the Business Times and host of this podcast, Wealth with BT. Today, we're going to talk about how philanthropy can be a powerful tool in the efforts to address and roll back climate change. Specifically, we'll look into how philanthropy can be a key participant in blended finance, which refers to the mobilization of both private and public capital for climate objectives. We have a guest in our studio, Anthony Kao of Pictay Wealth Management Asia. I'll introduce him more fully in a short while. You may wonder why philanthropy in the context of climate issues. In the continuum of giving an impact, philanthropy sits at the rightmost end. This area is most often associated with ad hoc giving with no expectation of return. In contrast, the leftmost spectrum is where private capital seeks and, in fact, prioritizes a level of return. In the effort to marshal transition capital or monies to fund the world's shift towards net zero emissions, much capital is needed to develop technologies and solutions that are new, disruptive, and exploratory. These solutions may be at an early stage of development, with a long road ahead before they can be commercialized. Resources are needed to expand and transform these technologies so that they can be used at scale. Rather than fund efforts on your own, philanthropy can join forces with partners via blended finance. Blended finance is defined as a structuring approach that enables organizations with varying objectives to invest alongside each other. It is catalytic, which means it's more patient than conventional capital. It's willing to take risks, often with little expectation of return. Virtually all of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals need such capital. Blended finance puts together investors representing public, private, and philanthropic capital. There is a global network called Convergence, whose mission is to accelerate blended finance. Convergence provides data to encourage deal flow, particularly into developing countries which need help the most. It believes blended finance has the potential to result in a tenfold increase in investments. Based on its data, this avenue of financing has already mobilized nearly 200 billion US dollars towards sustainable development, comprising nearly 7,000 financial transactions. According to Convergence, some of the UN SDGs lend themselves to blended finance more than others. Climate action is one of them. Of the participants in blended finance, the majority, or 64%, are private companies and funds. Philanthropy accounts for around 16%, and public funding around 19%. The Monetary Authority of Singapore sees blended finance as a key plank in its Finance for Net Zero Action Plan, which was announced this year. The MAS aims to scale blended finance by encouraging partnerships between the private sector and philanthropic foundations. In a speech, MAS Managing Director Ravi Menon pointed to blended finance as a powerful tool for transition projects that are marginally bankable. Singapore is currently developing a blended finance platform to help scale up financing for green and transition infrastructure for Asia. Mr. Menon believes philanthropic capital can be transformative, as he calls it. It is suited for co-investments in projects where private returns are low, but the expected social returns are high. To show the power and multiplier effect of collaboration, McKinsey estimates that $300 billion of public and philanthropic capital can eventually mobilize as much as $900 billion of total capital. 
this could help fill 40% of the net zero financing gap in the Asia Pacific. Today, less than 2% of philanthropic capital is channeled into climate finance. Of course, the MAS leaves nothing to chance. Blended finance structures are now eligible for the calculation of tax incentives for single-family offices. On such concessional capital, which includes climate-related investments, a multiplier is applied for the eligibility calculations. Our guest in the studio is Anthony Gao. He is Head of Philanthropy Services for Asia with Pictay Wealth Management. His work experience includes a stint as a senior program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he worked on strategies and managed programs relating to public health, nutrition, poverty reduction, among others. Hi, Anthony. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Jen. It's really a pleasure to be joining you today. So we're hoping you can help to give us an overview of philanthropy in the context of climate objectives. Among all the avenues of financing, why philanthropy? How can philanthropists integrate a climate approach into their commitments? Sure, this is actually a very timely topic because as we know, the world is coming together again, this time in Dubai for COP28 climate conference. And we can all see from the news that the world has just experienced the hottest year ever recorded in human history. Philanthropy means the love of humanity and climate change affects the very existence of humanity. It should be a main focus for philanthropists. But what may surprise you is that climate-related philanthropy has only been 2% of the overall philanthropic spending. This shows a general tendency for philanthropists in the past to focus on people directly, such as education, health, those kind of programs, while they think that environment is more indirect. This perception has been changing as climate change is causing hunger, diseases, and poverty around the world people start to realize that tackling climate crisis is improving human lives. But why philanthropy? Philanthropic capital offers unique advantages. First, philanthropic capital is a patient capital. It looks at the long-term outcome rather than short-term gains. And second, philanthropic capital is a risk capital. It can take the necessary risks that other types of capital cannot afford to. Third, philanthropic capital is a mission-driven capital. Its deployment can be solely driven by its potential social and environmental impact. These characteristics all help philanthropy stand out and make it a powerful tool in tackling the climate crisis. So what should philanthropists do? I think there are mainly four things. First, philanthropists should adopt a climate lens to the existing philanthropy. They need to understand their philanthropy's carbon footprint, and they should think about a connection between their work and climate. Even for philanthropists, say, who fund the arts, you can also add a climate lens and help raise awareness of climate issues through their work. Second, allocate a percentage of the annual grant capital to climate initiatives. Even though climate is not their main focuses, they can contribute a certain percentage of their annual payout, say 10 to 20 percent, to climate-related initiatives. There are platforms with ongoing projects and programs that can help them take advantage of any additional resources to achieve incremental impact. Third, fund via collaborative. Climate changes may feel insurmountable for any single organization, but through working together, you can reach the scale that is necessary to amplify the impact. Entities such as Environmental Funders Network, the India Climate Collaborative, the China Environmental Grantmakers, etc., are good examples for the collaboratives. Fourth, leverage all types of capital. If you have an endowment, look at how it is invested and whether it is funding polluting industries. If you have a family business, make sure it has good sustainability practices. This also applies to social capital, where you can leverage your voice to endorse issues. This brings forth the blended finance model, where philanthropic capital can be mixed with investment capital to drive greater impact. It has become more and more popular with philanthropists and investors who want to achieve climate impact. Still to come, blended finance may be the way to go if your objective is to achieve lasting change and most of all, scale. How can partnerships power up your philanthropy? We'll look into this shortly. And now, back to Wealth with BT, brought to you by Pictay Wealth Management. 
We have with us Anthony in our studio. Anthony, let's talk more about blended finance. And what benefits does it offer philanthropists who want to ensure their funds get maximum mileage? The blended finance, by definition, is the mixing of concessional capital and non-concessionary ones to achieve positive results both for investors and communities. Concessional capital, including philanthropic funds and development finance from the public sector, is generally willing to take higher risks and lower return as long as it is aligned with their missions. Non-concessionary capital requires a market rate risk-adjusted returns. The beauty of blended finance is that it takes advantage of the benefits offered by different types of capital. Philanthropic capital is patient; it can take necessary risks, and it is entirely mission-focused. But by itself, it does not have the scale necessary to tackle the climate crisis. Commercial investment is scalable. But it by itself is not suited to projects with low risk-adjusted returns. Development and climate initiatives are usually not offering the risk-adjusted returns they're looking for, so they alone cannot really work in the space. Government funding is also sizable and it is mission-driven. However, it is usually not flexible and it is influenced by certain political consideration. So, by mixing these types of capital, it offers clear advantages. First, it offers leverage. Blended finance allows concessional capital to mobilize more resources. This crowding effect gives concessional capital the multiply effect it seeks. Second, it offers additionality. What this means is that through blended finance, concessional capital can make a project that otherwise wouldn't happen happen. Building a solar panel may be too costly for a location. But with the incentives from the concessional capital pool, the deal is sweetened, and investors may get more interested. Third, it offers sustainability. For blended finance to work, it needs to generate some revenue. At the end of the day, if a project is too risky and generates very little or no revenue, grants are still the best option. But for projects that generate revenue, blended finance model can play a critical role as a proof of concept. Or pilot before it can be rolled out at scale. This may happen with less or even no concessional capital once its sustainability is achieved or proven.、Mm. What are the trends and approaches in blended finance? And can you share some examples in Asia? Sure. The largest sector that has seen the adoption of blended finance is energy, where it has been used to promote renewable. There still has relatively less adoption in sectors like health and education. Blended finance requires the generation of revenue. However, we're seeing governments getting involved by using public funding as a way to provide revenue for investors. For example, development impact bond has been adopted for education and health projects, where philanthropic capital and investment capital are used to support the delivery of social services and government funding, either from local governments or from aid agencies of a developed country, is allocated only when certain criteria are met. In Asia, this model has been tested since a successful education project in India in 2015. While the provider of concessional capital is still dominated by aid agencies and development finance institutions, who have a longer history of using the blended finance model, but the trend of growing philanthropic funding in blended finance is very clear. Today, charitable foundations have participated in almost a third of all blended transactions and represent 25% of all concessional finance and blended finance structures. While Asia has more than half of the global population, it only has less than a third of the blended finance deal flow, according to the latest data published by Convergence. Blended finance should see most application in lower middle income countries, where significant social and environmental impact can be made with a manageable level of risks. Asia has the highest concentrations of middle income countries. And we should be able to see much more upside in the region with the right support and incentives. Government agencies like MAS, multilateral development banks like Asian Infrastructure Investment Banks, and even some family offices have set up design funding windows by providing grants to organizations for innovative and catalytic blended finance. These have led to growing blended deals in their focused areas, especially on climate. As with most efforts that seek impact, scale is often a challenge. 
What gaps and challenges do you see in Asia in terms of skill for blended finance, and how can these be addressed? We need to improve the ecosystem. First, we need to raise awareness. Asian philanthropists may be more willing to explore new ways to deploy their philanthropic capital if they see the benefits. This requires more education and sharing of best practices, as we're doing today. Second, governments are playing a critical role to enable and encourage it, and they could do more. MAS recently made another significant step by providing incentives for family offices to deploy blended finance. Governments can also remove policy barriers by clarifying how philanthropic organizations can make financial investments that generate returns. A common taxonomy or standard should be adopted to measure the impact, so that more capital can be attracted. Third, development finance institutions and commercial financial institutions can help aggregate the blended finance projects. This addresses one of the key challenges for blended finance to attract investment capital, which is that the projects are usually small in size. Projects with similar design or theme can be aggregated so that it will make more sense for investors. I am confident as the ecosystem blended finance continues to improve in Asia, more and more philanthropists and other stakeholders will take advantage of the blended finance model as they seek to drive greater social and environmental impact. Hmm. So that was our guest Anthony. Thank you so much for coming over. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed our conversation. If you have a foundation or engage in philanthropic giving, weaving climate objectives into your program will touch people's lives. This is especially so in Asia, where developing countries lack capital for green infrastructure, and livelihoods are severely impacted by extreme weather. I hope this episode gets you thinking about how we can work with other organizations to enlarge the impact of your philanthropy. Until the next episode, thank you for listening. This episode of Wealth with BT was brought to you by Pictay Wealth Management. This is a podcast by the Business Times. Find more BT podcasts at businesstimes.com.sg/podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is meant to provide general information only. SPH Media accepts no liability for loss arising from any reliance on the podcast or use of third parties products and services. Please consult professional advisors for independent advice.